Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Pandemic and the ASC, How Surgery Center Leaders Can Manage Through the Challenges of COVID-19. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. I just want to first walk through some quick housekeeping details. So we will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is also being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access that recording. If at any time you don't see your slides moving or are having trouble with the audio, please try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box, and we are here to help you with that. With that, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Scott Becker, today's webinar moderator, who will introduce today's presenters. Scott. Thank you very much, Daniel. We're thrilled that you have this discussion today about surgery center issues and how leaders can manage through the challenges of COVID-19, obviously a key issue for all surgery centers throughout the country. We've got a great two presenters today, a great group of presenters today, Meredith Worf, Meredith Worf, the administrator of the surgery center at Mississippi Sports Medicine, and Helene Levinson, Senior Consultant, Clinical Operations at Cardinal Health. I'll do a very quick introduction or give you a sense of the bios of each, and then we'll, we'll kick it off and turn it over to Meredith and Helene. Uh, Meredith Worf combines her financial background and clinical knowledge gained as a physical therapist to bring a unique vantage point and strategy for the emergent ASC orthopedic landscape. Under her leadership, her surgery center is implemented meant implemented measures that improved operating margins, created efficiencies, and grown revenue. She's also led the surgery center expansion to the current 60,000 square foot 11 OR facility in Flowood, Mississippi. With the success of the outpatient total joint and spine programs, the surgery center was the first privately held ASC to attain Blue Cross distinction status, a designation previously only available to premier hospitals. So a magnificent job in leadership at the surgery center of Mississippi. Our second presenter is a brilliant consultant leader from Cardinal Health, Helene Levinson. Helene has over 33 years of clinical healthcare experience, 28 of which have been in the operating room in a variety of capacities. Since joining Cardinal Health in 2016, she's participated in clinical supply chain assessments, custom procedure kit, program builds and reviews, and led product conversion trials in a variety of ASC settings. She's worked closely with critical accounts, strategic accounts, identifying savings as well as efficiencies. Prior to joining Cardinal Health, she managed the 8 OR, very busy surgical specialty hospital. Uh, she also helped implement the total joint program and the delivery board. I will encourage our audience to have a QA at the end. Any time you want to ask a question, the chat box is all of our best to make sure we get to answer it. Joining us today, let me turn it over to the two of you. Elaine? Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much for joining us today. COVID has affected so many people in so many different ways, and the ASC space has certainly been one of them. Meredith, can you give us a little background on your facility? Yeah, hey, Helene, and thank you all for joining. Thank you for having us on today. Um, our facility, we're Mississippi Sports Medicine. We are a um, wholly owned by physician ASC. Um, we're owned by 18 different surgeons, and we do about 650 surgeries a month. We have also eight ACGME accredited, uh, we have a fellowship program for eight ACGME uh, fellows every year, so we are a teaching facility. Of those surgeries, um, every month we do about 150 joints and about 50 spine cases. So we do. Um, we also do some bundling with our payers here. So we like to think of um, a little forward strategy here. But we're in Flowood, Mississippi. Again, um, like Scott said, we moved in last summer, and um, it's it's an exciting space to be in. The ASC. It sounds like a very busy facility. Can you talk us through um, how COVID affected your facility from the very beginning, uh, even prior to having to shut down? 
Yes, yeah, so if we rewind back to about this time 12 months ago, we were ending um, 2019, which was, I'm sure for many people listening here, it was a banner year for a lot of us, um, especially in orthopedics and in the surgery center market. Um, we were at that time looking forward to January the 1st, 2020, when CMS approved for total joint arthroplasty, total knee arthroplasty to be done in the ASC setting. And so we entered into 2020 with a bang, you know, and had no idea what was in store for that, as I'm sure everybody else was in the same position. This Medicare total needs added about 40 cases a month to our um, caseload. And then shortly thereafter, mid-February, we had a gown shortage and um, had to kind of manage through that. We had heard rumors of other supply shortages down the pipeline, but we really um, worked with our rep from Cardinal through that, and he um, came alongside our materials manager and, and really um, worked through allocations and helped to manage the deliveries of those initial shortages. Um, we tried to plan as best we could, but again, we, we didn't really have an idea of what that meant for us. So you're dealing with all of that, and there's rumors circulating about shutting down the ambulatory surgery centers for elective surgery, and then it actually happens. How did you initially manage your facility in regards to your staff and your supplies and the shortage that was occurring? Yeah, I don't know if anybody really saw this coming. Like you said, um, fortunately, here in the Deep South, I mean, to be completely transparent, we are maybe a little bit later seeing some of the things um, that maybe initially hit the country and the the other geographical areas. So we did watch as our, um, you know, sister facilities in other areas began to manage through the shortages. But um, in late March, we did have a government-issued mandate to stop all elective surgeries. Um, even before that, though, we began to limit the number of people scrubbing in cases. Um, we didn't, um, you know, we didn't have residents that came in. Um, we purchased cotton gowns in preparation for a, um, a shortage that, that we'd heard about. And then, you know, we donated the PPE as we could to our hospitals who were on the front lines caring for that. Um, and, and how did we handle staff? You know, this is a tough question for a lot of, for everyone here on this call, I'm sure. Um, but our leadership, our physicians, we just really felt strongly that, you know, our staff, they're our greatest assets here and the importance of uh, employee retention, um, how you treat your employees during these crises is really going to have a long-lasting effect on their long-term loyalty and buy-in. You know, we understand that, that our assets are our people. There are, um, you know, people there on caring for the patients and giving them uh, that quality care that, that we boast about um, all the time. We were shut down for six weeks. We did not do any elective surgeries. We only performed urgent cases like fractures or spine cases where postponing that surgery may, you know, cause significant patient deterioration. So volume was extremely low, and fortunately, it was only for six weeks here. I understand other parts of the country, you know, are still having having issues, um, but we were closed for six weeks. And, and I'm sure that felt like a, a very long time. So now that you are um, reopened and you are back up and doing cases, what are some of the new challenges that your facility was now facing. Yeah, like I, you know, kind of alluded to before, one of the very first, the primary goals was to just create um, an environment well where the staff felt secure and safe and able to do what they do best um, to care for our patients and their families. Um, we also wanted, obviously, our patients to feel safe. So we, of course, um, you know, took all our CDC precautions and that sort of a thing. Um, we also really uh, started looking at the supply chain. You know, I think that ASCs typically don't think about that, but, but we did. And then we also um, began to think about it that way. But then we also dealt with uh, the decreased cash coming in the door, right, because your payers are working from home as well. So the speed with which they could process the claims was significantly slowed down. So, you know, the, the supply chain created increased cost and the payers were paying slower, so therein lies another problem. <laughs> yeah, so a, a lot of challenges all at once. Um, 
I've been getting back out into the field uh, a little bit recently and have been in some different facilities. And I've seen, you know, the effect of uh, the pandemic on the supplies. And a lot of facilities are now ordering extra supplies, even if they're not using the volume, um, they're continuing to order. And I uh, was in a facility recently where they had so much excess supplies that they were using a vacant office to uh, basically put all the excess into uh, almost like hoarding the supplies. Um, how has it changed how you are doing your ordering and how are you managing the limited space? Um, as we all know, the ASC space is not known for having extra storage space. Yeah, great question. I think you've um, hit the nail on the head and probably spoken to a lot of us in leadership at ASCs. I don't know of one ASC that, that claims to have enough storage, and um, you know we are certainly in that in that boat as well. And you know the natural tendency in a in any kind of pandemic is to hoard everything that you can. But then you compound that with the national shortage, and then you've got hospitals that need your PPE, and then you need to have it in case you need it or can't get it, or you know have an urgent case that needs to be done. So it is a, um, it is a, uh, I would say it's an individual issue with every ASC, and you've got to just be creative in how you do that. We did um, start to look deeper in our supply chain, um, you know. ASCs typically don't think about the whole supply chain like maybe a hospital would. We have typically thought about materials as you put an order in and it comes in the next day or the day after that and you have it and you're ready to use it. We've never really thought about the supplier um, for the supplier. So again, it is really the partnership with your vendor proves very um, you know, valuable, in especially as we've seen in the time of a pandemic, whether that be a um, national, you know, health crisis like this, or maybe it's a, a natural disaster like a hurricane that we've experienced um, several years ago here in Mississippi. It, it, any of that, just the relationships with your vendors really do prove valuable. I know there are so many challenges, and typically, you know, the materials managers. Um, are ordering, you know, per par level and according to case volume. Um, you know, the mindset in the ASC space is typically to keep minimal amounts of inventory on hand. Um, so how are they handling this new normal? Yeah, I'll tell you what, our materials manager is the unsung hero in this whole ordeal of 2020. Um, she has, she rolled her sleeves up and, and dove in and really just have to, and did an incredible job, as I'm sure many, many other centers, um, materials managers did as well. But just really, um, like I said, the tendency is to just order everything that you can, but we took a different approach and decided to you know, methodically change these PAR levels and, you know, ASC's pride, we pride ourselves in our efficiencies and not keeping all that extra inventory on hand because, you know, with nothing else said, it's just extra money sitting around that, that we obviously don't just have um, and we don't have the space like you said earlier. So our materials manager, again, just worked daily, several times a day actually, with our rep who are the other unsung heroes in this pandemic because I can't tell you, I can't imagine the number of overtime hours that, that those reps put in trying to manage allocations and move things from one warehouse to another and then deal with um, the delivery, you know, whether it's Cardinal or FedEx or UPS or whoever that is, trying to make sure that, that all of their, you know, uh, customers were taken care of. So we really worked with our rep multiple times a day. The next thing really is just uh, leveraging the data that you may or may not know that your vendor has. Um, it was really invaluable to us to sit down with Cardinal and look at previous usages, seasonality, um, you know, as the cases uh, weren't able to be done at the hospital, we began to see other cases added that weren't traditionally done here at the ASC. So you have to kind of plan for a lot of moving parts, and using that data helps to affirm what you are um, estimating and projecting for your uh, for your PAR levels and in inventory, and really does give leadership some confidence in um, how you're planning for that. 
I think the most important thing, though, is um, our materials manager is probably the most organized individual I may have met in my life. I know most of these, most of these gifted people are. Um, and just be really creative and make sure that um, things are done in an organized and methodical fashion. Um, that is, I guess, the best advice that, that we could give and, and to take the extra time to do that um, and to utilize that space as creatively as possible. Those are some great points, Meredith. Well, COVID certainly has changed everything in the ambulatory surgery space, including strategic planning and supply chain over the last several months. Um, what are some of the other areas uh, that have brought new challenges, including ones that surprised you? Yeah, another great question. These are um, sort of thinking about some of the things that that you don't ever uh, forecast that you'll uh, be working through, but just from the seat I sit in, you know, I won't ever read a contract the same way. We're seeing um, new clauses or our attention is drawn to existing clauses, maybe including a force majeure um, item where business is interrupted. What happens to those uh, perhaps commitments or um, whatever the contract is for? Um, looking at the how do we deepen our partnerships, our relationships with our vendors, implant vendors, um, med search supply vendors, um, whoever that is. We really want to make sure that we have um, aligned alignment in our vision and and what we want to do. Um, again, though, in the contracts, you know, what do these future contracts look like? I mean, I think we are seeing already seeing some some new ones now. Um, maybe it's a commitment level um, or a risk sharing on all sides, like a purchase commitment from the surgery center and then a supply commitment from the vendor. Um, does this look like a constant price that we pay or is it a constant supply guarantee? Again, it's kind of like thinking about hedging for futures with uh, medical supplies. We've done this for years in other industries like agriculture or oil and gas, and now it's made its way into medical supplies, and it's probably here to stay, to be honest, and, and you know, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, again, just proving that those relationships and, and long-term strategic goals with your vendors should prove um, beneficial. And then just looking deeper into the supply chain for the suppliers and where these raw materials are sourced from. Again, ASCs really haven't had a reason to, to do those types of things in the past, but we are starting to do that, looking more into how does this item actually get to my facility? Are there any logistical aggregators that we could look into to make things more efficient um, in deliveries? Just several of the things that, that we're starting to look into as we plan for the future. That's certainly a lot of challenge in a lot of different areas. Um, it's really affected the ASC space as a whole. Um, as I said, I've been getting back into some of the facilities, and as I've been going, I've uh, seen some new protocol being put in place um, due to COVID, such as taking temperatures um, when you enter the facility, as well as screening questions. Um, what have you implemented in your facility for your staff and your patients? And how has technology played a role in that? Yeah, so I think like everybody, we are wearing masks. Um, we, all the employees, you know, have to wear masks at all times, and all the patients coming in the buildings do. Um, we're still limiting the number of people coming through the facility. We've got, you know, family members waiting in the cars during surgery and um, asking people to social distance while they're inside. Um, you know, one of the the biggest benefits I think to these uh, to the ASC is uh, is our agility in the way we can change protocols. You know, we we have to be super flexible, and that's one of the things that we try to communicate to all of our staff and our patients as well. Honestly, because these protocols can change. They were changing hourly back during the shutdown, but now it could be daily or weekly. And so the um, the ability of the ASC to quickly change those protocols is a um, it's a large positive to what we can do here. But as we've seen these higher risk and acuity patients moving to the ASC, especially during the pandemic, um, we have had to alter some of the ways that, that we uh, do things and to quickly adjust. And we'll get more into that in a little bit, but it, that's the exciting part of it. As far as technology goes, 
um, we have had to implement technology because of the uh, limiting people in the in the building. Um, if you've got somebody waiting in a car, you've got to have a way to communicate with them. So it's really forced us as a company, as an organization, to push forward into that technology space. It's all over the news, and I firmly believe it. We firmly believe it as well, as this is um, the new wave of healthcare. And, you know, it, it could the importance of connecting with your patients via technology, um, especially in light of all the value-based care that's coming onto the scene where surgery centers are responsible for that episode of care post-surgery. So you're not only responsible for the day of, you've got to really collect that data after that. Um, and you can use telehealth for follow-up visits, um, remote physical therapy, you name it. The, the possibilities are in, endless with technology. Um, but Helene, I want to ask you, I realize, you know, these are specific to us and to our state, but, uh, you know, across the country, I'm sure this is highly, probably the most variable, um, the most variable issue uh, in the ASC market. So what have you seen as you've traveled um, to the other facilities recently? Um, I, I have seen a variety of um, protocols put in place, and I, I do think that it depends on uh, state mandates. Um, I've been in some facilities where all pa patients are tested uh, for COVID prior to surgery. <clears throat> I've, I've also been in uh, facilities where no testing prior to surgery is going on. Um, the majority of places are all wearing masks at all times, and I have noted that patients are coming to the OR with masks on, as well as leaving the OR and going to PACU uh, with their masks on. Um, I've seen change in protocol for the turnover process. Uh, some facilities are having a longer time after intubation um, with starting their surgery, and I've seen uh, a longer wait time after extubating before going to recovery. So it's, it's really varied uh, quite a bit. Um, the one thing I have seen in a lot of facilities is a shift to the use of disposables. Uh, things that were cleaned uh, between patients, a lot of people have now moved to just using a disposable, such as blood pressure cuffs or EKG leads, um, and even using turnover kits in the operating room, which contain disposable sheets and draw sheets. Um, there has been a lot of change uh, to decrease the cross-contamination for the patient, and I think that's just a big focus for everybody right now, which, you know, is challenging in so many different ways. Um, and I know, Meredith, you've spoken of so many different challenges. Have you seen anything good or positive that has come out of this pandemic for your facility? Absolutely. If um, we've said it several times, if there has been anything positive about 2020, <laughs> it has been the uh, the way that that the pandemic has propelled the shift of surgery cases from the hospital into the ASC space. And this is not news. We knew this was happening. It's just the speed in which it is happening. Um, no one wants to go to the hospital unless you're sick now. Um, the doctors, the surgeons don't want to go, the patients don't want to go, and it just makes sense, especially if the procedure can be done very safely with very good outcomes in the ASC setting. Um, with consolidation in the marketplace, um, our partnership with, uh, with Cardinal has really proved beneficial because of all of the different, um, the different products or value adds that a um, well-aligned vendor can offer. Um, our strategies are really more forward-thinking. I mean, how does this actually benefit the practice as a whole as well as the ASC? Um, you know, we're having to think about this increased volume of cases and then reevaluate our plans as they are moving quicker out here to the ASC than we originally thought. But again, the agility that an ASC can afford to quickly adapt to that rapidly changing environment while we continue to provide quality of care to patients is really gonna, gonna make this whole thing work. You know, we really believe that the runway is still very huge. Last year, it may have been a five year, super long, um, clean runway, but now it is is now shorter and, and maybe much wider as we really see all of this come onto the scene. 
So moving forward, Meredith, do you have any recommendations for other surgery centers to end this year, 2020, which has been like no other, on a positive note? Yes, absolutely. I think our motto for most people in in the country has been, let's just make it through 2020. But we really are trying to come up with a strategy to not only start 2021 better with a better plan, but to really finish 2020 strong. Um, I've said it several times this uh, presentation, but partnering with vendors and suppliers um, is really in our opinion, the future of this ASC market and really the key, the absolute key to being able to maintain that low cost of healthcare that can be provided in the ASC setting. A lot of vendors are creating value adds for their clients that that aren't being taken advantage of. Um, I would suggest to really sit down with your reps and maybe the distributor of your vendor of all types and ask for a new demo. You know, what is it that you're that's available that you're not taking advantage of? Maybe it's a logistical solution that you could save a lot of money on freight while receiving your products more quickly or more assuredly. Maybe it's a risk sharing situation like we talked about earlier. Um, and then maybe it's a technology or a data solution. Um, Again, moving toward the value-based care and the bundled payments with payers, if you don't have a patient pathway set up, that's a constant communication that you can set as robust as you'd like to for, uh, you know, it's differentiated for every case or just as a generality. Um, But look into quickly doing that and see if your vendor already has a solution. There's no point to recreate the wheel. Um, Utilize what they they have. Um, And as, as patients are forced and it's a great thing for them to take better control of their care in the ASC space. I mean, we're not keeping people for two or three nights and having a, you know, case manager tell them where to be at every minute. I mean, this is a um, shift of responsibility of patient care and it's really a good thing. Keeping patients connected throughout all of those phases of recovery allows the responsibility, again, to be put back on the patient. And it also kind of gives the ASC another way to ensure that um, the data required for that value-based care is being collected. Data is king, again, all types, cost data, supply data, outcomes data, demographic data, you name it. So those ASCs that can really leverage that data to produce quality studies and demonstrate your outcomes are going to better be able to partner with your payers, which has been a benefit to us here at Mississippi Sports Medicine. Um, Again, the ASC is the premium place to have a maybe higher acuity surgery, such as a total joint arthroplasty or a spinal fusion or whatever that may be, just due to the lower cost that we're able to to have here. Um, The last thing is really just to look into strategic partnerships Um, now Consolidation is here. It's been in healthcare and other markets in the last five to ten years, maybe, you know, dermatology, ophthalmology, but now here in in orthopedics we're seeing it more and more, especially post-pandemic. The ASC um, is looking more toward how maybe they could mitigate some of this risk, right? As, as these higher acuity patients are moving to the ASC setting, your joints and spine and cardiology and all these other um, disciplines that we're seeing, um, they come with risk. And I think ASCs are trying to strategize and find ways to mitigate that, that risk. And one of those ways is to partner with a strategic partner It can look a lot of different ways. Um, I think it could be a maybe a hospital system that could help with referral sources or maybe legacy contracts to provide a temporary lift to your rates or your reimbursements. Um, Maybe it's a management firm that is um, very efficient in handling claims and maybe staffing or efficiencies, or maybe it's private equity. Um, We found that that is a very great option as these higher acuity cases require more and more capital items and then back to the data requirements again, um, the unknowns with smaller ASCs are hard to, sometimes that's that's hard to plan for. Um, And and one of the the reasons for looking into a partnership is to mitigate that long-term liability. Um, With the increased regulatory burdens necessary, 
by these advanced accreditations required. Um, it is going to be much easier to tackle that and strategize that if you, if you look at what a strategic partner can offer you as an ASE. So if you really believe that the future of surgery is lower cost, convenient, quality care, lever to leverage you know, these excellent providers with the resources that, that can be made available for data collection, payer negotiation, and bundled care, um, really try to look into these strategic partners. It may or may not be a fit for your surgery center, but um, you definitely don't want to leave an option on the table that, that may be a good fit. And then lastly, just get ahead before the end of this year. Don't wait to start. You know, the um, bundled payments are here, so start looking what that, you know, start seeking out what that, that looks like for your organization if you're not already. Look at the advanced accreditation um, that are being required by the payers in order to attain those bundled payments. And so really, let's not just get through 2020. I think you can really maximize our time and then start 2021 on an even better note. I think bottom line, though, is the ASC is the place to be in the next five years. The feature is, is so exciting, not only for the ASC, but for um, you know, the payers and the patients. Everyone's excited about it because it's really a win-win for everyone. And in healthcare, sometimes that's, that's hard to find. So we are super excited about the future and um, what it may hold. So I think looking forward, the future is very bright. Those are some great recommendations, Meredith. And um, I would agree. I think there's so much potential for the ASC space. And I know in the next five years, we're going to see um, a, a big increase in volume and uh, surgeries coming that uh, were typically only done in the hospital. So, so I would agree with your statement that the future does seem very bright. Meredith, thank you so much for your time today and your insights. Um, I know we are all working so hard to keep our patients safe and to have good outcomes from surgery, which is always our focus. With that, I'll turn it back over to Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith and Helene, for a great informative presentation. We've got a whole number of questions from the audience. I'll get started right away. Um, let me ask you this question, and Meredith, I'll ask you this, and then Wayne, I'll ask you to put your input into it as well. With COVID cases spiking again across the United States, Meredith, what do you see the ASC doing? Are you preparing for the second wave? Are you thinking about it? How do you sort of get yourself thinking about and preparing for a second wave? Yeah, thanks, Scott. I think we're all thinking about it. Um, how we prepare for it is uh, really just our continued strategy that we refine almost daily here at our surgery center. I mean, we're not going to get caught on our heels again like we did at the beginning of this year, but really trying to, um, again, the supply chain for the suppliers and working with our vendors and, and looking deeper into the areas that we may have even just taken for granted before. I think it's probably the best way that we can prepare. Um, there's only so much that we can control. So like I said, just don't want to get caught on our heels again. So our strategy is just to make sure that our operational strategy is in line with um, what's going on. Thank you, Holly. Let me ask you this question. How are centers that you talk to, that you interact with, minimizing the impact on turnover times with the extra steps that are being taken to sort of keep patients safe with COVID-19? So what kind of things are you seeing or hearing about minimizing the impact of turnover times? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of the um, changes and challenges have have added turnover time between cases. Um, a, a few things I think that can help is, um, first of all, make sure that the um, disinfectant that you're using uh, in your OR has the short short kill time. Um, I've seen everything on the market from one minute to 10 minutes. So you certainly want to make sure you're using a short kill time in your disinfectant. Um, I think using disposables where you can. Uh, the turnover kits are uh, a great help as well because it's all uh, bundled together. It takes less time to gather the supplies and then it's disposable so they can, you know, be thrown away after each case. Um, in addition, I think, 
reviewing your custom packs to see if you can add any of the components that you're having to single sterile open and get those into your custom packs, um, that will decrease your time in between cases as well. And if you're not using custom packs currently, that might be something you want to look at to consolidate those products and make it a, a, a quicker uh, opening between cases. And I think the last thing um, is, is to be organized, to be prepared, um, you know, from case to case and uh, just try to stay in the routine. And Meredith, let me ask you this question. And I'm not sure that there's any difference pre-COVID and in COVID. But is there anything different that surgery centers are doing to make sure their communities know that they're a safe alternative today? Anything you could think of that you're doing to sort of publicize that? Meredith, let me start with you on that question. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, the only thing really that we've done differently post the pandemic is to make sure that our marketing efforts have targeted um, the safe environment that our ASC can offer. We want to make sure that everyone knows we are open for business and that we are very mindful of all of the, uh, you know, uh, precautions that are put out by the CDC and our government, and so we want to um, just show that we are, you know, abiding by that, but at the same time that we're open for business. Absolutely. And Helene, let me ask you this question, and you must get this from talking to so many different surgery centers and surgical facilities. The question is, storage room is full. Are there any other ideas on how to store supplies, stock supplies, and so forth if the storage room is overloaded? Well, storage is always an issue at every ASC I've ever been into, um, and, and now it just seems to be more challenging as people are trying to stock up on supplies. So a, a few things that I would recommend, um, you know, this is a great time to assess your supplies and maybe get rid of things that you're not using, or if they're not used often, you know, box them up and put them um, sort of elsewhere to allow room for the things that you're using, um, you know, daily and in excess. Um, the other thing is there typically is extra storage space in the OR rooms themselves. Can you add some bins? Can you utilize that space for overflow? Um, that typically is a good area to um, put some extra things. And then um, one thing I try to remind people is to look at your vertical space. Um, I know a lot of people use bins in their supply rooms, um, but a lot of times you can actually stack bins um, on top of one another, allowing you to put more supplies on the shelf and utilizing that space that you have. So um, the only other thing I would, you know, suggest is to see if there is office space or additional space in your building that's not being utilized that you might be able to use for excess supplies at this time. Thank you. And Meredith, let me ask you this question. Do you keep patients overnight for observation? And if so, do you stay at that in the other hospital beds or how do you take care of those patients to keep overnight or for 23 hours? I'm sorry, Scott, the phone was cutting out. So do you keep patients overnight, and then how do we staff that? Is that the question? Yes, exactly. Overnight, 23 okay. hours. Yeah, what do you do for more complex patients? Yeah. Absolutely. So we do. We've got four um, bays where we can keep patients for 23 hours if needed. And, again, that's decided by the surgeon or anesthesia. It's really by the anesthesiologist after surgery is, is over. And if the patient has, you know, uncontrolled pain or maybe unforeseen, unforeseen um, you know, respiratory issues or, or whatever that may be, we do keep um, some patients overnight. And then we staff. We actually use a staffing company for that because it's very hard to predict when those cases are going to occur. 
Um, we do have hospital beds and we have a you know four full hospital beds there and the protocol the accreditation regulatory um, environment for 23 hour observation is a little bit more cumbersome than just a traditional um, accreditation so just make sure if, if someone's looking into doing this just make sure that you work closely with your um, with your regulations and um, you know follow them to maintain um, compliance but yes, we do have hospital beds and we outsource the staffing just for overnight cases. We've found honestly that, that patients, more patients than not, do very well to go on home as long as there is a um, available on call, uh, you know, for us it's a fellow or our care coordinator who sees all of our, for example, all of our total joint patients before they have surgery. So they all have her number. Um, but to answer the question, yes, we do keep people overnight. Thank you. And, and Helene, let me ask you this question. Staff. Staff in this pandemic situation is very challenging. People are very concerned about the unknown future. They're very concerned about the chance of getting infection. Besides constant communication, guaranteed salaries, and praise, are there any tricks or not tricks, methods to keeping staff happy during this very difficult time? Yeah, I think that's um, probably um, the magic question, you know, and just making sure that uh, the the level, the confidence that that the staff has in leadership um, will is going to determine their buy-in, right? So we just want to make sure that they recognize we are putting them first, and um, maybe not the volume of cases performed that day. So we want to make sure that they feel. Um, you know, very safe. And if we've tried to be very accommodating, I know for us, a lot of our staff have children who are not even back into school yet. They're at home trying to do distance learning. And so we're, we've had to be very flexible and find creative solutions to make sure that we work with those um, employees that, that are looking for childcare, for example. Thank you. And Meredith, let me ask you this question. If the patient's COVID negative, are you still following the guidelines to wait 15 minutes per your HVAC room air exchanges, or does the COVID negative result negate this process? I take it it doesn't, but let me hear your answer to that. Yeah, no, it doesn't negate the process. For us, our, our orthopedic surgeons have, they, they run two rooms, and so it's really not an issue. Um, I think 15 minutes is about the average turnover time um, that we aim for and that we um, we strive to, to maintain. So I think it's all, it's a great question, but I think it's really a moot point. If um, all of our, I mean, obviously every patient in our facility is COVID negative, so um, we do wait the 15 minutes. I think that would answer the question. Yeah, absolutely. Another question, are, are you finding that patients are decreased to not being able to quarantine or not being able to get COVID t testing? Are, are you finding some of the sort of volume not where it should be because patients are struggling to get tested and get the results back? You know, we really forecasted this problem. I remember we discussed this in our um, June uh, Surgery Center board meeting and how we were going to handle that. And fortunately, it has not been an issue. I think we've had one patient that we've had to postpone the surgery by one day because the COVID test was not, it had come back, it just wasn't conclusive. So we did have to wait on um, that one case, but out of, you know, thousands of cases since then, we've not had a problem with it. Well, that's fantastic. Another question, and Helene, let me ask you this question. People ask about, are you having different challenges with billing and collections, revenue cycle during this period of time, or, or not particularly, and obviously not Cardinal itself, but the centers you work with, any things you're hearing about revenue collection, revenue cycle, and so forth? Um, I think with the decreasing cases, you know, there, there's been some challenges, um, you know, financially for some of the facilities, um, but I've not really heard um, from any of the facilities that I've been in in particular struggles. Mm -hmm. I do think it's important to see over this um, 
And sorry, Scott, I was going to add just just a little bit. No, we during the pandemic time, um, one of uh, one of the things that we had our billing team do, we do internal billing and collections, um, and they spent their time combing the AR and making sure that um, everything was attended to. And I think to have meticulous enforcement of contracts, especially with decreased cases, is um, very very important. You know. Uh, in the ASC space. And another question, the how do you overcome the influx of surgical trays in your steel processing department? How do you manage this? Meredith, let me ask you that question. Okay. I mean, it's a little different than the stocking supplies question, but a little different. How do you deal with sort of sterile trays, surgical trays, and not being overwhelmed with them? Yeah, so thankfully in our new center, we have a huge central sterile department, and we're very thankful for that. We wanted to make sure that we have enough instruments, and in our ASC, we tried to actually set the precedent that everyone helps with instruments, right? It's not just our decontam and central sterile employees. So if you're a rep standing there, you're going to be expected to help. And so I think getting the manpower and even the the in morale enforcement that that brings about and the team mentality helps to overcome that. But to be honest, Scott, trays are trays. The other way that we've handled that is to really try to minimize the number of instruments in each tray, and your vendor can help you do that. Yes, um, Scott, I was going to add to that. Um, I have seen, and I think that's a great approach, Meredith, um, to make it a team effort and um, not just um, – someone in particular that's responsible. I have seen facilities um, who have done just what Meredith said, consolidate um, instrument trays to get it down to limited numbers, especially when you're doing total joints and you can have anywhere from, you know, eight to 10 different trays um, for that case. Um, I know a lot of facilities have move to try to consolidate to get down to maybe four or five cans of things that are utilized. Um, and agree, the, the reps, uh, the techs, uh, everyone works together as a team to, you know, try and uh, work through that process. Thank you. And another question. In terms of managing the COVID testing, Meredith, let me direct this to you. Is it being done by the physician offices, the, pre, the pre-surgery the pre COVID testing, or is it being done out of the surgery center? How, are we, how is everybody handling getting the COVID testing done for patients? Yeah, you know, I think this is variable across um, different areas and how what best fits your practice. For us, we decided that we were going to utilize a um, – local area clinic and hospitals to get those testing. It's not, we didn't want to have those potentially positive patients coming into our own urgent care facilities. So we, we do outsource those tests. So the question is, with the, um, you know, with the increased number of cases coming to ASC, are you adjusting your BMI limits and, and how you look at body mass and other types of things? How are you dealing with that? Are you seeing that kind of flood that you have to worry about that? Um, well, you know, we do live in Mississippi, so that is always a question. Um, no, we are not adjusting our BMI limits. We've set those based on admission criteria for our center, and they're set with our anesthesia team and our surgeons. Um, I think the issue is, is more than we still have a, a flat BMI cutoff, and we're not going to change that. But really, we've read some research, and the issue really is in more of the health conditions that that person has in addition to BMI. So we are looking more into that. But to answer this specific question, no, our, our cutoff is our cutoff. In, Elaine, in terms of surgery centers and staff, are all staff members wearing N95 masks? What's the, what's the situation with that? You know, Scott, I have um, seen a variety in different facilities. Um, I have seen some that, um, yes, are all wearing N95 masks. And then those facilities that are doing uh, COVID testing, a lot of their staff is not wearing the N95s, and they're just wearing the um, 
regular masks that they typically use in the OR. So I, I think it varies from place to place, and I think a lot of it depends on, you know, if they're testing their patients or not testing their patients. Uh, the majority of the facilities have basically set their own protocols depending on that. Thank you. I want to do this. I want to encourage our audience, anybody else has the questions, please do print it in or, or write it in in the chat function and we'll try to get to it. Uh, I'll give people about 60 seconds to put in questions. And uh, Meredith and Aline, in the meantime, I'll thank you. An incredibly timely presentation of a lot of issues that people are dealing with. My tremendous kudos to both Meredith and the success of your surgery center and Aline, the, the amazing work that Cardinal has done in this area uh, just over the last several years this year. Uh, to improve the efficiency and greatness and the ability to do business as surgery centers. So, presentation. Take a quick look to see if anybody has chatted in a question. Um, if there's anything that wasn't answered, we'll get them to Meredith and Aline to take a look at. I want to wrap up by thanking the audience. Remarkable work that you do in the world that you're in and treating patients in this COVID era. And I want to thank Cardinal Health, magnificent company, great sponsor. Thank you, Cardinal Health, for all you do for the healthcare ecosystem. And finally, Meredith, magnificent surgery center that you're running, really amazing. Uh, thank you for joining us as well today and sharing your expertise from the field. Thank you, folks, all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.